summertime. In the dog days, they say. Actually, the hot spell in July and August has nothing to do with panting dogs. It seems the Romans associated this time with the dog star that rose with the sun. They called the hottest 40 days of the year days of the dog star. So you can see how that became a dog days of summer, can't you? We're talking fishing and a new deer killing book that's a fantastic read when you're not fishing right now, when we go out in the open. Welcome to this edition of Out in the Open. I'm Alex Zedock. And I'm Joanne Zedock. And wow, we were really lucky because we've been an interesting guy at the boat ramp at Lake Wall and Paw Pack. Yeah, you know, we were there and uh, I thought he was a guide, but, uh, you know, John was not a guide, but uh, boy, his boat was fitted out like a guide <laughs> boat. And uh, he just fishes the Northeast. And uh, the good thing is that he takes and tapes all of his fishing expeditions. And he's got a YouTube page, so you're going to want to explore that because a lot of good information. And speaking of trailering your boat, uh, you may want to go down to the Potomac. Uh, we were on Potomac River not too long ago. Yes. And, uh, boy, you can take your boat down. The fishing is great down there. There's a lot of ramps that you can choose from. But uh, it's shallow an area, so you got to be careful. If you're a shad fisherman, of course, up here in the Delaware, where, you know, where, Joanne, where it's shallow in a lot of those places uh, along the Delaware, right. you might want to take your jet boat. But you don't have to. And if you're a kayak type person or canoes, perfect place that stretch down there. Right. We saw a lot of people on kayaks and canoes. We certainly did. It would look like it was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. It can <laughs> be. Uh, and we have a story from Tim Flanagan who wrote a book called Night Killers. Now, he's a 30 year veteran of the Pennsylvania Game Commission. And wow, some of the stuff that he's written in that book is hard to believe, but he's got the scars and the nightmares. Uh, and memories to prove it. So stay tuned, we got a great show for you. Don't go away. Hi, my name is John Shpolsky. I am from Northeast Elite Fishing on YouTube, and today we're fishing Lake Wall and Paw Pack. Lake Wall and Paw Pack is a beautiful lake. Uh, it has stripers, uh, hybrid, and beautiful walleye in it. Uh, the lake is, uh, it's a very large lake for Pennsylvania. I want to say it's the second largest lake in the state. Uh, summertime, you know, great fishing for walleye, great fishing for stripers. Uh, fantastic time to get out this time of year and, uh, and hit the lake. So I've been fishing about 45 years actually, actually 47. I started when I was five years old trout fishing with my father on a small lake uh, in Wyoming County called Lake Winola. Uh, we used to troll, troll around in a little 12-foot uh, rowboat. With, we didn't even have a motor on the boat. Uh, he used to just oar us around and we would troll either flies or flatfish for, uh, for trout. John, you've got uh, a pretty sophisticated rig here. Uh, so you're, you're pretty into fishing. Uh, do you fish just Lake Wallenpaw Pack or do you fish a lot of other lakes? Where, where do you primarily go? Yeah, I fish all over the state, uh, anywhere from here to Beltsville. Uh, I also do a lot of fishing in New York State, uh, Finger Lakes, Lake Seneca, Cayuga, uh, Oneida. I, I try to get out as far as I can, you know, and as many times as I can throughout the year. I, I fish tournaments also. Uh, I normally do tournament fishing in uh, early spring and it's for lake trout, Lake Cayuga uh, and the National Lake uh, Trout Tournament at Seneca. And I also do walleye fest. Uh, I have a tournament coming up in September. I want to say it's the first week of September at Lake Cayuga. It's a Bears Bait Trout Tournament, so it'll be a lake trout tournament. If you follow me on my YouTube channel, you'll see all the action. Uh, the tournament action is on there. A few trips to uh, New York. Uh, we did uh, Walleye Fest early in the season. Uh, I think there's even some, some work uh, with the Garmin and some of the equipment that we use just to try to get people out and you know that's the whole premise of my page is to, to try to get people involved and try to get more people out on the water and give them a good opportunity to, to catch fish. If you're going to come up to Lake Wall and Paul Pack this summer to fish, 
I would suggest uh, stick baits, of course live bait, uh, a drop shot with a worm or live bait will always work. Uh, I also like to use worm harnesses uh, for walleye uh, and you control, you know, you, you control at any depth, uh, you know, that you, you find with those. Uh, probably the most effective way to fish is, uh, is a troll up here. Once again, if you want to see more of my stuff, go to Northeast Elite Fishing on YouTube and check us out. Uh, I hope you guys will hit that like and that subscribe, and I hope I get to see you guys out on the water soon. So here's a little piece about uh, fishing the Potomac River. Uh, it's interesting, and of course you're a bass fisherman. What a great place to bass fish. Hey folks, sometimes you know it's really great when you get some fishing tips right from the well, not the horse's mouth, but right from somebody who really knows what they're talking about. And, you know, we're all interested in catching more fish and bigger fish and all those things. Josh Hennessy here lives right on the Potomac River. And, Josh, you do a lot of fishing. Uh, I do. What do you specialize in? Uh, well, I, so I grew up on the Potomac River. I cut my teeth on fish with smallmouth bass. So that was the first species that I sought after. Kind of became obsessed with them from a young child. Uh, moved off for a while. Um, Let me talk a little bit about the smallmouth bass to yep. start with, because that's something that you know all these bass guys want to do. You no, know, everybody wants to catch. It's they got bass boats; they want to catch smallmouth. Pound but they the travel. Strongest fighting fish there is. Yes, th absolutely. Um, what's your favorite but go-to bait? Like, uh, uh, let's seasonal. say in the middle of the summer. Middle of the summer, I like to fish top water. Uh, recently, I've I've found a lot of success with soft plastics. Okay. Weightless. Um, so I'll take like a zoom fluke on a uh, circle hook, no okay. weight, and just kind of fish it like uh, the action reminds me, I, I remember as a child they had the infomercials with, for the banjo minnow. Oh right, and right. And it, it kind of looks like that, the way yeah, it darts yeah, yeah. and dodges through that. the water, but the bass seemed to love it. Yeah, so how are you hooking it up? Are you hooking that up uh, just like through the middle? Or are you yeah, just it nose hook it. Pardon? Nose hook it? Yeah, nose hook uh, it, like okay. Like you would fishing a live minnow. Uh, no you know? weight, just letting it out there. And, just letting and it out there. You throwing this in the in the shrubbery? Uh, or no. on top? Or? Not a whole lot of vegetation. I find in the summertime, you kind of want to seek out current. Current holds more oxygen. So the tail ends of current pools, um, and they move up in pocket water and whatnot. So I'll fish that pretty thoroughly. So what else do you fish? Uh, I, I was bitten by the musky bug for about five or six years where I devoted a tremendous amount of time chasing muskies. Um, and I quickly learned that they earned the uh, reputation of a fish of 10,000 casts for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's uh, your record musky, your personal uh, best? My or? personal best I think is 47 inches, um, which is, uh, you know, the cream of the crop for the Potomac. Uh, I don't think I've talked to anyone that's seen one over 49 inches, so that's the upper echelon. How we how we catch a muskies? Huh, what's, what's that, the that's a good question. And what time of the year is the best time? <laughs> they are the most finicky species I have ever fished for in my life. Uh, they could be, you could have a 40 inch muskie that just lazily follows your bait in and kind of nips at the tail, or you could have that same fish an hour later explode out of the water and you know, eat your bait. Um, it's, it's Are we using hard baits? Yeah, hard baits, artificial, exclusively. What else are we getting in on the Potomac? Uh, there's uh, walleye. I have not mastered them. I, I usually go after them early spring, so February, March. Uh, they kind of make a run upstream before spawn and concentrate below dams. Um, so I'll fish for them at that time and they're they're a little different than say jigging for bass or other species uh, you kind of cast more across and let the current sweep your bait downstream and work it back up but river fishing is difficult because you need to have good contact with the bottom that is the key um, you want your lure to actually touch the bottom but not lay on the bottom so as soon as it touches and I learned how to do that to some degree by watching my line so I'll watch the line. I started fishing uh, braided line with a fluorocarbon uh, leader. On how long there. of a leader are you putting on that? Uh, that depends on how many snags I get. I usually <laughs> start with about, uh, I'd say, 8 to 10 foot leader. And then, you know, like I said, depending on the day, it could shorten to 
six. If people want to come, you know, into Maryland and when they want to fish the Potomac, uh, you know, Pennsylvania is not that far away and bass fishermen, you know, cart their boats around all the time. Right. So they go different places and right. try different things. Uh, what's a good place for them to kind of put in or start? You so know, it's, uh, I guess the biggest thing is, and like you said, someone familiar with that kind of shallow, rocky river profile, uh, jet boats or some kind of kayak floatable raft is the best. Um, um, what's the uh, what's the pan fishery like there? The, it's decent. Uh, the crappie have kind of tanked um, more recently. We've had an invasion of flathead catfish that seemed to target panfish. Okay. So I have I have recently jumped on that train, and it is it is fun. Uh, they are fun to catch. I, we haven't figured out uh, what kind of ecological damage they're having yet, but. Uh, they are a powerful fish. Uh, it's kind of funny when you're out there, because um, the channels kind of occupy similar habitats, and you can always tell the bite. Usually a channel, you'll get that bink, 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 but the flatheads is more like a walleye or smallmouth hitting a jig. You just kind of get that flick of the line because they inhale the bait. Um, and then once, once they're hooked up, it's, it gets real quick. That's fun. A that few snakeheads have appeared. Snakeheads? Um, have you eaten yeah. a snakehead? I have. I have. I heard yeah. they're pretty good. Yeah. I haven't eaten any yeah, yet. Yeah, they're tasty. I guess anything. I'm not a big fish eater, uh -huh. but anything fried's good, right? <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Hey, thank you for all the insight. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no uh, problem. And, uh, you know, from what I hear, Maryland's doing a pretty good job of, with their fisheries. and it uh, appears so. You know, they, yeah, yeah appears so. That they, can, you know, they seem to be uh, ahead of the game and, and keeping track of, you know, what's happening in the water. So it's a good thing. Yep. And I know a lot of people from Pennsylvania might want to come down and do some fishing, and maybe we'll join them and come down and maybe we'll give you a call we'll go out in the potomac absolutely all right hey thank you appreciate no talking problem. to us yep our friend tim flanagan wrote a book called night killers and it's all about poachers and his experience as a 30-year member of the pennsylvania game commission uh and uh, you know he's got the scars nightmarish memories of nearly losing his life interesting read Hey, folks, we're talking with our friend Tim Flanagan, and Tim is no stranger to Out in the Open. Uh, of course, uh, we've uh, talked a lot about Tim's book, uh, Grouse and Woodcock, The uh, Birds of My Life, and uh, Tim uh, wrote that fantastic, uh, um, epic uh, story uh, about Grouse and Woodcock that's become nationally acclaimed, and he's come back with another book. You know, Tim was a uh, wildlife conservation officer in South Central Pennsylvania uh, for 30 years. And uh, wow, what are some of these stories? Night killers, bloodlusting poachers. And what a read, Tim. Um, it's hard to believe that someone, I, I, it's not hard to believe, but I mean, you were a game official, game warden basically, a uh, uh, wildlife conservation officer. But people don't realize, they think you just ride around in the car and check licenses. Oh, well, there's much more to it than that. And, and there's all levels of, of game law violations. A fellow that makes a mistake or just a, an accidental uh, mess, a mess up on tagging or something, that's not the guy we're looking for. The guy I set my sights on was the night killer. That's the name of this book, Night Killers. The guys that are premeditated killers that go out there at night with a spotlight and a high-powered rifle, when, quite on, commonly a 22. To kill deer at night, he's a premeditated killer. He's a stealer of wildlife. He's a thief. And in no way should those people be equated in, in any degree with hunters. They're not hunters, they're criminals. And that's the guy I wanted to target in my career and I did so for 30 years. Seems to me, and I know a lot of people out there would think, oh, come on, one or two poachers here or there. But um, in reading your book, it seems like um, in certain pockets of the Pennsylvania, they've, there's gotta be a lot of people that do this all the time. Yes, it's habitual and it's, there's a lot of impetus for it and it's not, we need food for our family. It's usually just, we want to kill bucks. We want to kill deer just for fun. We want to get over on the, on the game warden and we want to be able to go back to the pool hall or the bar room and brag to our buddies how many deer we killed and then get caught. So when you're, when you're me pursuing these criminals, it's like uh, when you catch a night shooter actually shooting a buck at night it's like uh, taking a big trophy buck because everybody we encounter throughout our hunting, our, our patrol, 
for carrying guns. But the night killer is not only carrying a gun, he's out to kill. He's a blood-lusting poacher, which is the subtitle of this book. I'm going to say it again. I'll bet most of the people watching this show are thinking, come on, uh, somebody goes out and shoots a deer at night here or there or someplace in the state. And I guess this is more prevalent in certain areas of the state where, I mean, this becomes a passion with people, like, like in this book, Night Killers. You, you, you won't believe some of the stories uh, that are in this book. Um, it's, just, it's just amazing. Yeah, and these people, I said, are very, very dangerous. One of the best things that happened to me is on the first year in the job, a man tried to kill me in the field. And he was hunting with two with sons and being a single parent child growing up, I assumed this was a nice situation to walk into a hunter and his sons. And it turned into a deadly encounter where he tried to kill me and I was justified in taking his life. That was a very beneficial thing to happen. Because, but you didn't. No, I did not. I got him. Uh, I lost a lot of blood, went to the hospital, got him under arrest. But it educated me to be alert all the time. And with night hunters, you especially have to be alert. Night hunters are never alone. I've never I've caught hundreds and hundreds of night hunters, night killers, poachers, but I never caught one by himself. There's, all, there's always two, quite often three and four, and four is very, very common. Not only are they out to kill, they're usually under the influence of something, most commonly alcohol, but increasingly uh, in, these, in this day and age, control substances. It's just amazing. Let me get this ant off you here, climbing around. He's, we're sitting on an ant pile, I think, right here, but, uh, uh, but a comfortable place to do the interview. Um, you know, it's, it, again, it surprised me uh, just how many and how much of that was going on in your, in your area. It, it's pervasive, and uh, I know a fellow who came into our area started a new business. He's from out of the area. I met him after I'd retired and he said, uh, Tim, I've never seen an area, when he found out what I did for a living, he said, I've never been anywhere where people are so overwhelmed with the concern about killing deer and getting over on the game warden. It's a kind of a local thing. It's a, it's a twofold thing though from your book. It's not just, it's not just killing the gear, deer, but it's getting it over on the game warden yes, and, and uh, getting, you know, getting the upper hand basically. Uh, my district was very rural. Uh, down along the Maryland line was where most of these accidents ha or shootings happen. And the deputies have jobs. So they've got to get some sleep at night. So mostly, almost always at night, I was by myself. I rarely had a deputy with me in the wee hours of the morning. So you're by yourself and you've got four men who are drunk and armed and one ready to kill and want to fight. They'll re they will resist in some way, whether it's, uh, it's fight or flight. They're either going to fight or they're going to, going to run. And when you get them stopped after you've had a high-speed chase, you usually have a fight on your hands. You've got a, uh, I, I've been punched, kicked, choked, hit with cars. Uh, I've got had a few broken bones, and I've been shot at many times. And, and part of the problem is you also have a daytime job. I mean, you you know, it's not just they don't set you in the field in an area of maybe 50 or 100 square miles or whatever you covered. Uh, and say, uh, okay, just go out and, and find poachers. I mean, you've got so many other duties as a wildlife conservation officer that you have to do. Basically, you know, I mean, when do you get the time to do it? You only, you can only work a 40, 45 hour a week. What, what, you know, what do you? Actually, what I, all, almost all of my night poaching uh, activities, the chasing activities and law enforcement at night was done on my time. I was volunteering time because we had so many duties during the daytime, you know, Back then we picked up all the road kills and we handled all kinds of animal complaints and hunter ed and school programs and youth field days with all, all kinds and sort of operating or checking on permits, you know, special permits and taxidermy and so forth. All of that consumed the daytime hours. So when I worked at night, I was working on my own time. The daytime hours, uh, however, uh, in many cases, um, just you in the community, getting around in the community provided you with a lot of contacts, uh, people in the field, people who are honest people, people who wanted to see the poachers done with. And uh, they were sometimes, according to your book, uh, in more jeopardy or as much jeopardy as you were because if these poachers found out who squealed on them, these people would be in trouble. Yes, and we've had, and we've had that happen. One of the most valuable things the conservation officer has is good informants. We can't be everywhere at one time, although I tried to make the public think I was. The good informant will put you onto a spot where you're likely going to catch one of these poachers. 
if they get found out, when they give you information, you have a good informant, you must first keep that com absolutely confidential to you and them. Nobody must know they told you. You must act on it. You must give them your word you're going to act on it. And when you do act on it, if you make an arrest on their information, you go to them and tell them and thank them, but keep it quiet because these poachers do go back and threaten these people. Had that happened in a number of in the, uh, number of times. I've had people uh, shout it quite often, shout at people that come out of their house and, and yell at a, a night poacher, and they'll say, "Get the so blanky blank back in that house, or we'll shoot you too." Wow! So it takes a lot of courage to inform on these nighttime killers. They're bad people. Let's put this back in a perspective. In in a year, how many? Dear, do you think of poachers or poachers killed in your area that maybe you didn't even know about? Oh, we, I think we get 1%. If, we, if we're lucky, I think we catch 1% of them. It's very, very difficult so to catch So how many deer them. do you think they kill? Oh, 1,000? 500? E easily, easily 1,000. Uh, when our deer population was really high, our, the farmers in Pennsylvania, some, sometimes a farm will be left to a son. The older farmer dies, and this young son just goes nuts with crop damage killing. Because in Pennsylvania, a farmer may shoot every deer he sees any time of the day or night. He can use a spotlight or whatever. And for a number of years, I had several farms that were shooting over 100 deer a year on these farms. Wow. So it adds up to thousands of deer. So, and that's a, that's a great loss to the public. The farmer is permitted to do that, if he, but he has to do it within certain guidelines. Uh, but there's no limit to how many he can kill. The poacher has no limit either. He'll kill all he can. We had a pair of brothers who were killing deer three years running. We tried to catch these people. We had good descriptions of them. We put together a sort of a, a diagram, a method of operation that was pretty much standard for them, but it took us three years to apprehend them. And they were only killing bucks. They never shot a, an antlerless deer. They only shot bucks and they left them lay. Every one of them just left them lay. It was all along one main corridor uh, going south out of Bedford where they did this killing. It took us three years to catch them. They killed hundreds of bucks in those three years. Wow, amazing. Night killers, bloodlusting poachers. And uh, Tim Flanagan, uh, of course, 30 years as a wildlife conservation officer, uh, got some stories in here that, uh, you know, it's hard. You read the stories and you say, wow, people really do that and they do that. And you put yourself in danger protecting this wildlife, uh, protecting, uh, but I guess that's what you're sworn to do, right? So what we're sworn to do, we have a couple, you're up against a couple things, not just the poacher. You're up against lenient court systems. It's, it's no, the rural courts are notoriously lenient on game law violations. I've had uh, judges say, oh, well, officer, you proved your case. I know you're guilty, but I dismiss the case because they know the person, it's a family friend, or it's a voter that they're, <laughs> if they like their vote. Um, and you also have uh, supervisory people that aren't real happy that you're making so many arrests. Uh, our game commission back then, and this, this book should have no reflection on the current game commission. I've been retired 19 years. I worked for them 30 years. And so this shouldn't reflect on the current game commission. But back then, we were expected to take a certain amount of punishment in the field. One supervisor said, hey, you're a game warden. You've got to get used to getting thumped around now and then. We never prosecuted people for threatening your life, shooting at you. Um, the fellow that tried to kill me, he was charged with uh, aggravated assault with intent to kill. He got five years probation and paid the court cost. And I got the, the they gave me the shotgun he tried to kill me with. And the scars. <laughs> yes, but there's a, so there's a pervasive attitude of laxness or let's, let's not upset the public. The Game Commission used to have a phrase called an acceptable level of compliance. My acceptable level of compliance for night killers was zero. And it should be all of ours because these guys are criminals. They're stealing from the good sportsmen. And the real sportsman is the game commission's, game, uh, game officer's friend, and, the office, and vice versa. Should be a joint mutual relationship where we work together because it's all about preserving and managing wildlife, not killing them at night and wasting them. How can people get your book, Night Killers? It's only $14.95 and it's available at Amazon. Just go uh, type in Night Killers Tim Flanagan at Amazon.com, and in two days you'll have the book. Fantastic, and uh, I hear there's a sequel coming out too, a uh, short time, so you got to get this one. And uh, it's a good read, it really is a good read. Hey, don't go away, we'll be right back.
We hope you enjoyed the show. We enjoyed bringing it to you. Of course, we travel around a little bit uh, this time of the year. We were down at the Potomac and up at Lake Wallen Paw Pack. And uh, if you really want to have an interesting read, uh, pick up Tim Flanagan's book, uh, Night Killers. Uh, it, uh, as I said, it's a kind of hair-raising experience that he had while he was uh, with the Pennsylvania Game Commission some 20 years ago. But uh, very interesting. It will surprise you. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the show. We enjoyed bringing it to you. We're going to be here. We're going to be somewhere. We're going to be out in the open. Absolutely. Absolutely.